All right. Hey, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us on Zoom today at Venture Cafe. I'm Angela McQuillan, and I'm the curator of the Esther Klein Gallery at the Science Center. So this is, if this is your first time joining us, this is our weekly series here at Venture Cafe where we can get an inside look into an artist studio. I'm really excited to speak to our guest today, Caitlin McCormack. Caitlin has a background in illustration and she does a lot of different types of work, but she's most well known for her crochet sculptures of animal skeletons made from thin cotton thread. So um, Caitlin received her BFA in illustration from the University of the Arts in Philadelphia. Her works have appeared in solo and group exhibitions nationally and internationally um, at the Mütter Museum, the Taubman Museum of Art, uh, Mesa Contemporary Art Museum, Hashimoto Contemporary, and most recently the Spring Break Art Show in New York City. So Caitlin currently lives in Philadelphia and her studio is inside her home. So now I'm gonna go ahead and welcome our guest, Caitlin, how are you doing? Uh, I'm, um, <laughs> you know, um, quarantine in my house, um, <laughs> right. and, uh, my neighbors, um, sing karaoke starting at 1230 at night, uh, every night. I heard the same thing from someone else today. So there's another person in your same boat with that issue. Maybe that's the person that lives on the other side of <laughs> my neighbors because <laughs> it happens pretty much like clockwork and it's, it's great. It's yeah, good. there's a lot of um, third eye blind. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, nice. So you you live in South Philly? Yeah, I live uh, in the East Pashunk neighborhood. Okay. Um, you know, so it's it's kind of a it's a neighborhood that's constantly changing, but also not changing at all at the same time. Mm -hmm. uh, Definitely so interesting. <laughs> cool. Yeah. So your studio is inside your home now for quarantine, but you, you generally work inside your home, right? I, so I, um, I have a studio at the Bach building, which is also in South Philly. Oh, right. Um, for people who don't know, it's a technical, a vocational technical high school from the 1930s that was, um, converted into, uh, like artist spaces and, um, a bunch of other, uh, kind of areas something's going on with the screen right now sorry sorry um i'm just i'm just muting everyone just to make sure because anytime someone else talks it comes up yeah but if again if you guys want to ask a question feel free to unmute yourself cool uh so yeah the the bach building is is this beautiful art deco high school that's been converted into artist spaces and there's a salon and there's bakery and a coffee shop and all different kinds of things there's a um like a dance company i think they're going to be putting an art school on the top floor at some point which is really cool um but i i work there sometimes i kind of use it as a showroom so when creeps on the internet want to come see my work i don't have to let them <laughs> into my home because i was doing that for a while and it felt kind of weird oh really yeah i um, can imagine but i'm a very introverted person so i i tend to work at my house uh primarily because it mm -hmm. I, you know, there's a lot of pressure as an artist to keep a studio outside of your home. Um, so I, I do it and I buy into that, uh, even though I probably shouldn't because I work here most of the time. Yeah, I feel the same way. I mean, I've had studios before that were outside my home that I would like hardly ever go to and use them more for storage. Yeah, I feel like it just depends on your personality. Um, so yeah, wherever you're the most productive. Exactly. Yeah. And I think it also depends on like um, how well uh, you're able to manage your own time, mm -hmm. you know? So like some people can't work at home because they get distracted, but then I guess you're, you're very productive. So you must um, be really good at focusing. <laughs> I'm bad at all the other stuff like showering and eating and, you know, and anything. I mean, I'm not that I'm amazing at art, but I, I'm, a, I'm, better at working than I am at not working. I think you're pretty amazing at art. Oh, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to show us some of your images? Uh, yeah, so I made a really long, I mean, I, I guess it's kind of long, but I'll go through it really quickly. Um, you don't have to, there's no rush. We'll just like talk about everything while yeah. you're going through. Um, I made a, a, a PDF presentation kind of um, tracing my illustration roots into the development of what I'm currently doing. Um, so 
I'm going to do the screen share on this new computer <laughs> uh, desktop one share. So you're going to see your own face, I suppose. Yeah, there it goes. Can you see this uh, illustration of a little guy? Yeah. Okay. So we'll, we'll go to uh, full screen. We'll see if this works. Um, so can you guys see like yourselves and the little bar at the side? Yeah, or uh, I can. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I'm, I'm still figuring out how to use this computer. But uh, yeah, so I made this slideshow. Um, that's me with a bucket on my head as a child. Um, and uh, yes. Yeah. So I'm a, a crochet artist. I work with really, really fine cotton thread that is dredged in a mixture of glues um, multiple times until I achieve a level of hardness that's kind of like a very delicate bone. That's actually how I started uh, making the osteological specimens, but I, I'll get into that in a little bit. Um, I, Can uh, I ask real quick, when you use the glue on your pieces, do you use the glue like as you're working or do you crochet it first and then and then soak it in glue? I crochet the pieces um, individually, the bones individually, and then I apply the glue and then I lay them out to dry. And then um, after several more repeated glue applications, I'll sew them together into the final specimen and then I apply more glue. And um, the weird thing is that, that that's actually my favorite part because the um, once the, the full sculpture has been assembled but is wet with the glue, it kind of responds to the ambient qualities of my, of my studio. So um, if, someone is, if, if someone's visiting my house, I have a, a visitor that's, you know, so you have to walk through my studio to get to the bathroom. Mm -hmm. um, so if I have a visitor that's coming in and out of my studio, uh, the, the creature, like the bird, for example, will kind of lean a certain way because there's been wind generated by the door. It, it's all oh, wow. affected by these like very nuanced um, ambient conditions in my studio. Um, so I, that, that part's really interesting for me because there's a level of um, unpredictability. Um, it like, must also be based on your movements too. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah, if I'm, if I'm uh, you know, doing something that requires way more movement throughout my studio, there's definitely um, a visible difference in the sculptures that are uh, drying at that time, which is interesting. Um, mm -hmm. you know. So yeah, this is, uh, I make things like this. This is um, installed in a ginger, what's called a gingerbread clock case, which is um, something I collect because I use them as shadow boxes since they're very deep. And um, I think they were created in the 40s and 50s onwards um, from woodworking kits that people would buy. And then you would install like a, like a clock in there, but you can get the empty cases um, at antique stores and uh, flea markets. So I kind of search them out and I, I refinish them. Sometimes I need to um, use wood and, and kind of um, patch up certain areas or I've, I've done some ungodly things <laughs> that I won't even mention to try to make them look whole again when they've been kind of falling apart. Um, so I, I won't even get into that because it, <laughs> doesn't make me look good. Um, so here's another one. It's a snake. Uh, so I started out painting illustration school. I, I went to UArts and I studied illustration and I, I had no idea what I wanted to do. I just kind of like made work that reflected trends or not even trends, just stuff that I liked, which was prim primarily weird illustration from like the early 1980s, um, kind of like DIY punk scene art, um, Gary Panther and stuff like that. And I, you know, I had no idea what to do, um, you know, obviously. Uh, so then I started making these 3D illustrations, which were essentially just, you know, sculpy three-dimensional versions of the, the paintings and drawings I was doing. Um, and this cool. is the first and one. And you would just, would you photograph them in different ways? Yeah, I would, I would shoot them in different ways. I would, you know, this one doesn't even have handmade furniture. This is the first one I made ever. I made the doll and the painting and the bear and the books and the quilt, but every, this is just dollhouse furniture. And it allowed me to kind of try different compositions, which was really cool because I love film. I love cinema and, and allowing that to have some sort of place in making illustrations was like completely 
a complete revelation for me. So, you know, I really enjoyed doing that. And I started realizing maybe I should have majored in sculpture because, you know, I, uh, I mean, I guess the combination of cinema and sculpture is illustration in a lot of ways, um, yeah. you know, or, you know, uh, stop motion animation, but these are just like single frames from stop motion animation films. Have so you I made um, animated films? I've done a couple, uh, I took an animation class, I took a couple, and uh, I made some things, but they were just disasters. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so I started making these and, you know, getting more and more involved with, you know, the compositions and textiles and, you know, stuff like that. Um, I uh, got really into, you know, textural things, and I, I realized that as I you know, became truly immersed in this, I was moving further and further away from depicting very coherent narratives in the work. So it was definitely moving into fine art territory. You know, like what publication is gonna use this as an illustration for anything? <laughs> I, I definitely was not, you know, someone who should have been making illustrations. This is a sketch. I don't know why I never wrote the D in Gould. I don't know, what's wrong with me? Um, <laughs> This is like an in-progress shot based on that sketch. Really liked making that piano. Um, That's really cool. What did you make it out of? Just cardboard. And so much of this is made out of garbage because it was what I had available at the time. It was like a broke college student. Not like I'm not broke now. You know, <laughs> but, um, yeah, and this is like what's inside all of those dolls. I was getting a little bit more, uh, having a little bit more control over the the structure of the, figures and things like that. Things became a little bit more elaborate. I was also making costumes at the time. This is like two people in a suit about to get run over by a car. That's really um, funny. <laughs> we left the car on and we got out and put the costume on and then took it off and then got back in the car. So <laughs> this is the kind of stuff I was doing. This is like a failed, you, you had mentioned showing some failed work. This is what I view as a failed piece. It's like a segue tour where someone turns into a werewolf. <laughs> um, why is it a failed piece I, I just hate the way this one came out um okay. it was, you know, sometimes you take these pictures and if you don't really know what you're doing they're really difficult to edit and uh you know they just don't come out the way you want them to mm -hmm. um but you know these are some some more this is a picture based on l ron hubbard so <laughs> that's all i'm gonna say about that so that's that's clay yeah, it's Sculpey. Okay. Um, and then this is, his hair is made of feathers. You know, when you're making these little dolls, you have to find fibers and textiles that have a, um, like a gauge or a, a, a texture that is comparable to the size. Like you can't use a piece of cotton because the thread count is so high that it's going to look like they're wearing a sweater. Oh, right. So, you know, I couldn't use yarn to make his hair because it looked like dreads. So I had to use a feather because those fibers are so thin. Wow. So I realized that that's, you know, that's, that's probably something that everybody makes models new, but I was so self-taught that, you know, and I've been making stuff like this since I was a little kid. because so I grew up pretty, you know, in a pretty low income situation. So I had to make all my own toys. Um, wow. So, yeah. And then so you've you know, always worked on a pretty small scale. Yeah. I've had small studio space. I would love to work, you know, on a larger scale, but you know, what I have available to me is, you know, generally the fixins for smaller <laughs> stuff. This is some- I like that ferrets. one. Yeah, she's, she's not, it doesn't bode well for her. <laughs> this guy either, he's, he's really in a bad situation. Um, her, you know, she looks like my aunt. Um, I did use these as illustrations, um, for some, you know, uh, purposes. I was, I did make some money off of illustration. This is, uh, my friend, one of my closest friends, uh, poetry books. Um, this little doll that I made for Locust Moon comics back when they existed. Of, uh, Nemo. That's his, that's his ass. Oh, wow. <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. Mm. mm. <laughs> Um, and then I made these escort ads for an anthology about uh, erotica. Um, this was one of my favorite things that I ever worked on. <laughs> um, it's just a butt. I enjoyed this one a lot. 
Um, and I did a comic for City Paper about Lou Bloom and how he's a giant spider that lives in the sewer and eats your car. So I made it out of, you can't really see this because it's so pixelated, but this giant spider comes out from a pothole and consumes this person's car and, you know, it's just a really bad day. Um, and I made this out of some, I was just when I was starting to work with some alternative materials, like her head's a walnut, her eyelids are my fingernails, which is really gross, I'm sorry. Wow. Her <laughs> nose is a bean. Um, I'm just really sorry about the fingernails, but then I actually made a full thing out of fingernails. Which I've known really a couple awesome. artists who've made things out of fingernails. Yeah. Like they're there, you know. It um, just means that you have to actually collect them. <laughs> yeah, it takes a long time. Um, so yeah, I made this. This is when I, I just, I graduated and I didn't know what the hell I was doing. So I made this in the shadow box and I started like doing things like taking pine cones apart and numbering them and putting them in these boxes. Like I was just trying to make fine art, you know. Um, and I started doing fiber stuff, like making this huge dress, which, uh, was illuminated. This was on display at Paradigm Gallery, um, in their old location. That's pretty amazing. Thanks. I actually showed this at Little Berlin when... I remember. Uh, yeah. <laughs> when we were both members. Yeah. Um, it was, you know, sketches for that kind of thing. Um, and then I made this, I started working with crochet, um, you know, it, it, uh, there was a, a period where my grandparents were both very ill. Uh, my grandfather eventually passed away and my grandmother had dementia. And um, it took, you know, my family had to spend a lot of time with her because she forgot that my grandfather had passed away every five to 10 minutes. Oh, man. Someone had to be there to remind her. And, um, you know, she taught me how to crochet. She, through through it. It. she what? She probably had to go through it every yeah. single time. It's What's weird is that she after a while, like, didn't seem like she was hit as hard by it, so it's, like, a part of her remembered, but she needed to hear the words. It was mm -hmm. really a strange experience, <laughs> um, but I started working with crochet, you know, while, you know, spending time in her home, because uh, I needed something meditative to work on, um, and I was doing these sketches, um, kind of dark, you know, thinking about death and, and bodies and ephemeral notions um, and I started working with the crochet to to make these skeletal pieces because they reminded me of bone uh, on, a, on a microscopic level and this is a really terrible photo of the first piece I made um, which is a, a coelacanth. Is that a coelacanth? Is that the type yeah. of fish? The very one of the most ancient fishes. Fishes. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> wow it's really beautiful. Thank you. Yeah, this is an old, old ass piece at this point. Um, and then I made, you know, I, I was, there was spring, I was coming across a lot of fledglings, just like right now, if you go for a walk, there's little dead birds everywhere. But I started making them out of this crochet and it turned into this whole thing where I just couldn't stop creating these animals totemic of uh, specific memories out of this material that my I, I have inherited a great amount of string from my, my grandmother and her sisters, and um, I was using that. I, I still use it. Uh, this was a photo by Jason Chen from Paradigm, the bicephalic bat. Um, you know, and it, they started to become a little bit more, uh, deviating a little bit more from authentic forms. I was less concerned with um, recreating the skeletal structure so accurately and it was more about memory mm -hmm. and installing them in these domes. So when you make these are you are you working from sketches first of all and are you looking at any kind of like textbook or model or something to to show you the anatomy? So um typically like best case scenario I go to a museum or a collection or archive where they have the specimens, uh, the osteological specimens available for me to view and I'll, I'll um, observe it in person and then I leave and I do a sketch from memory because the, the work is about how time can sort of warp and distort a memory and it deviates you know, further and further from its authentic seed, like the mm -hmm. platonic metaphysics of your 
memory become, you know, the circles become broader and broader away from the authentic source. And um, I, uh, so, you know, as a result, I think a lot of my, my uh, forms are like a weird hybrid of human, humanoid and animal skeletal structures. I think just because the humanoid form is what I'm intrinsically most familiar with. Mm -hmm. Um, so, but I, I, I like exploring that deviation. That's what a lot of the work, especially at this time, that's what that work was about. Um, and it, maybe my work will always be about that in some way, shape or form, but this was especially about that. Um, I feel like creating this type of work is almost like a transition in your life because it seems like, um, you could just completely like adopted this new style. Yeah it's a lot more serious and it's also kind of like um victorian like yeah, do you but, have like a lot of victorian influences or were you looking at a lot of things during that time you know i like i'm i'm a, my work is associated with hair art and stuff like that and since i use these these convex glass frames uh the work is posited in that kind of a with that sensibility very often but I would say I'm more inspired by horror films like David Cronenberg and and John Carpenter like body yeah. horror I'm way more inspired by that than Victorian um lace work even though it, it's incredibly inspiring to me and I love looking at it the I don't actively think about that as much you know morning jewelry and stuff like that I I definitely get the associations but it's not primarily an influence for me um so this is like one of the biggest guys i've ever made it's a um full-size juvenile coyote skeleton uh, it's currently on display at the fort wayne museum of art um this is uh like there's something like 35 guys in here and they're on dual layers of plexiglass uh, so one layer is suspended over the other one with spacers and um so it creates like a floating effect and it's such a bitch to put together. <laughs> Jesus, I bet. My framer hates me. <laughs> um, just another one, maybe just like about my feelings about putting the plexiglass in there. There's another clock case, but this one is, there's a, you know, there's maybe three layers of plexiglass in this one. Um, and this is kind of the experience of looking into that you know, you're, you're confronted with this layer effect. Wow. Um, these are some sketches, you know, I use like layers of mylar and stuff like that, that this piece is kind of based on the sketch a little bit. Um, I started using furniture to make these kind of almost like Snow White's elevated casket where people can view her, you know, before she gets kissed by the prince or whatever happens. <laughs> um, it's a, a fawn. And I grew up in the woods and uh, animals are very significant to me. Not that there are sharks in the woods. This is a shark. Um, wow. This was I on love that, that. What is it on too? That's a really interesting piece of furniture. It's an apothecary um, drawer cabinet. Oh, wow. um, so I, yeah, I, I found this and I made hand, I did handmade labeling for each of the drawers and I installed this shark on top and then there's different bits of all the things the shark ate in all the drawers. Um, so that was, that was a fun piece. Things like this were in the, hidden in the drawers, you know, and I just do a lot of sketching. My sketches started to always involve the string. Um, Hmm. Isn't so much the case anymore because I'm sort of moving past that. But this is from my two person exhibition with Sabrina Small at the Mütter Museum from 2017. Um, we made a, we, we each made bodies of work that had a lot to do with um, death and the physical process of becoming an object almost. Um, I don't know why butts is up there. Um, it's kind of based on that sketch. It's a drawing of something my teacher and friend sent me. Um, <laughs> this piece, 
It's like a bunch of heads on a spine. Um, I, I started, really love how you arrange the string around it. It's this like, guy. Yeah. Yeah. I, I um I started getting into kind of geometric forms at this point for some reason. Um, yeah, I'm really kind of focusing on humanoid. I think because the Muda Museum, um, part of the the deal with having that show was that the work had to be had to relate to their collection. So it had to be human or humanoid specimen based work. Um, so I made a lot of pieces that had to do with the human form as opposed to animals. Did um, you spend a lot of time in their collection when you were making this those pieces? Yeah, yeah. yeah I did. Well, it was I, like I, one of the weirdest things you saw. <laughs> I mean, my favorite thing there is um, the uh, collection of things people have swallowed. Mm. There's a yeah, whole, I've seen that. <laughs> yeah, there's a for I mean for people who don't know, there's a the the Muda Museum is a museum of um, medical, I don't want to just say medical oddities, because there are some very straightforward scientific, you know, um, specimens that just have to do with bodily functions, you know, archived since the mid 19th century or early 19th century, but they, um, they have some very strange uh, oddities on display, including this, this catalog of weird things that people have for whatever reason decided to swallow and either you know passed in some way shape or form or just like they were found with them inside them when they passed away um so yeah it's a it's gory and uh very gruesome but i i like it um but yeah the museum is at 22nd and chestnut um if you yeah, want let me give a, I'll them. give a link in case anyone yeah wants to check it out. Yeah, and they they definitely have a lot of information online too. I wouldn't be surprised if they have some virtual tours right now and during the pandemic. So um, it's definitely worth a follow um, or checking it out online. Um, so yeah, there's more bodily boys, body boys. Um, <laughs> skull it's another skull and i started getting into floral stuff with plants i'm really into plants right now mm. um so this is a bad photo on here but it looks really good uh, other times but this is from my show my solo show granny at hashimoto contemporary in san francisco which opened in october of 2019 um and i, I love your use of color Thank you. Because I feel like you've done a lot of work with just black and white, which is very elegant and I love it. But Thanks. when you add color, it sort of adds like a more playful, like fun tone. It's much more um, aligned with who I really am. Yeah. I don't, I don't know why, why I stuck with the binary color palette. I don't know if it was like I associated it with seriousness or I just want, I, I like operating in very limited parameters. It makes mm -hmm. me feel liberated to some extent, um, at least only in my work. Like as a person, I don't want any parameters. I refuse. <laughs> um, and I don't think anyone should have to operate within parameters unless they're like, you know, ones that hurt people. But um, I, uh, I think I, I might've gotten something from that, limitation in terms of color but after after a while I just I had to start working with uh, at least plant derived color palettes um, yeah. because I, I, I think that humor and whimsical elements are, are very important. Um, so was yeah, this it was hard to do that? Like was it hard to break that routine? Like yeah. how did you feel when you did the first color where you're like oh my god? <laughs> I was like, everyone's going to think I'm stupid. I, <laughs> I worry about people hating me and thinking that I'm an idiot. I mean, I, I am, I am, I am so insecure. I have such an inferiority complex. I feel like the dumbest person alive. That's all crazy time. because your work is amazing and you're sure like very, you're a very well-known artist. So <laughs> I feel like this, like the biggest dumb dingus that oh, ever, wow. that ever like crawled out of the scum. <laughs> That's how I feel all the time. No. I made this piece and I realized after making it that it looks like a monster energy drink. <laughs> so that was cool. Um, you know, 
And there's some little like guys. Thanks. Yeah. Um, and that's, you know, this is an install shot. I made some wallpaper, which was awesome. I loved, I love um, just the installation aspect of creating. Oh, you made that? Show. Yeah, I designed it and um, wow. the gallery printed it for me because they're Hashimoto contemporaries, like they beyond have their shit together. They're amazing. Where's like, that gallery located? Um, it's on Sutter Street in uh, San Francisco. And then they also have a Lower East Side location in Manhattan. Um, oh, okay. But it's one of my favorite galleries. And I, I can't believe that they, you know, offered to give me a show. I, I really loved working <laughs> with them. They're, they're awesome. Um, and uh, right now, you know, when it comes to the plant aspect of my work, I'm really focusing on these muted, damp, northeastern United States deciduous forest colors, um, mushrooms, muted kind of olive greens and sage colors. I, 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 um, you knew, I use natural pigments to dye some of the string. That's been really fun. What um, do you make it from? Just uh, like turmeric, you know, <laughs> things like things I've collected. I've taken some classes in dyeing uh, using natural dyes. So that's the least I've been able to use that information somehow um cool. yeah this this piece is is very much aligned with the kind of work that i'm working on for uh an upcoming show in december um and then i've just kind of been leaning into this like stuff i this has got some boobs <laughs> um that's like a whole new direction for yeah, you <laughs> yeah this piece was um on display at spring break in new york with in liquid um, this is a tablecloth with a bunch of like white dicks slithering over the horizon. Um, dicks and boobs. That's where I'm. That's where I'm at right now. Um, and this is a series of buildings on top of this like creepy 19th century romantic cliff. This like Wuthering Heights mansion on the edge of a like a rocky ocean made of books <laughs> one of the books is by ann coulter oh wow um and you painted them black yeah, except for one one word <laughs> yeah. uh this is obviously a reaction to you know what's going on right now uh which is you know hard to look at <laughs> i started making these tapes with uh made up porno titles which um is really you know I like uh, having a sense of humor is really important to me and not being able to communicate that through my work successfully uh, it was there but it didn't really come across to anybody that was being able to to communicate that has been really fulfilling are not you talking everyone... about are you talking about your um your skeleton work didn't yeah I feel like I definitely feel like your um 3D illustration had a lot of humor and then your work became more serious and then now it's kind of like branching back into a yeah. realm of humor. Yeah, I, I just, I, I really enjoy the intersection of horror and humor. Mm -hmm. So I think porn is like, like this VHS tape, this Cronenberg-esque VHS tape that's like undulating and like casting out these sinewy tendons trying to ensnare you and like, I don't know, tether you to the tape itself but it's also porn about thong mommies. I just think that that's, that's who I am um, in, a, in a very fulfilling way. You know, um, I've been stifling that and just, or not stifling it, just not thinking it would be relevant in my work. But now I realize like I can kind of, you know, maybe it's like having a, if not now, when sort of sentiment towards this current situation. That's like, I should just start making work that I like as opposed to the work that's been profitable. Um, I made this, you know, cause it's true. Yeah, uh, this was, yeah. Is this inspired by the pandemic as well? I mean, it's, you know, it's inspired by like an, an ongoing, you know, concern of mine since birth, but uh, yeah, definitely exacerbated by present conditions. And yeah. If you guys want to follow me, this is my thing. I put a nice glow around the text so that it looks really terrible. <laughs> and um, that's my website. Yeah. So I'm going to stop screen sharing now. Is that okay?
Yeah, that's great. Stop share. There we go. <laughs> All right, so since this is a studio tour, do you want to show us um, your workspace? Sure. Um, so I'm going to pick my laptop up and kind of carry it around, I guess. Is that okay? Yeah. I'm trying to... Wow, these new uh, laptops <laughs> have really strong magnets on the, <laughs> the, the charging thing. Um, so yeah, I guess I'll just pick this up. Um, so yeah, this is my workspace. Um, I work at this table and I've got uh, my threads and all this fabric, lots of fabric. And um, this like cart where I have all my glues and paints and sharp objects. <laughs> um, and this is, my uh can you see my goose where is it there it is yeah, my goose. It. um <laughs> what does the goose mean to you uh it's a it's a lamp uh, i like geese i guess um it turns out i like geese because i bought a hat with a goose on it the other day <laughs> i guess i really like geese i don't know um you like a lot of birds i do i do my grandfather used to carve birds uh out of wood and um he would give them to everybody like the postman Post, postal worker, not the postman, the post office worker. Um, he would give them to uh, random people who would like rake leaves for him. Uh, everyone he knew got a wooden bird and they were beautiful. They, they looked real. Um, so I think that's a big part of why I, I make a lot of birds. Um, so this is, a, this is one of those layered pieces. Um, oh, wow. There's a lot of, you can probably see your reflection in there how about that computer. <laughs> isn't that cool yeah <laughs> that's what this should really be about um so yeah that's one of those layered pieces that's got um it's this one I, i'm not super fond of i got it back from a gallery and i immediately convinced myself that the gallery hated me and that they never want to work with me again because Why they sent is that? It back. because that's <laughs> just how my brain works oh. <laughs> um this is a collaboration with um, michelle consack Consic? I'm sorry, Michelle, if you're here. I don't know how to pronounce your last name. <laughs> Isn't that great? Um, so uh, Michelle is a really amazing watercolorist and um, gave me this piece and I was supposed to embellish it. So I matched the colors of this uh, stream that she painted with oh, wow. hand dyed embroidery thread and then created like a, like a weird outpouring of, of pigment and color and then I situated these skeletons around it and I think it's done but I uh I'm not quite sure yet. anything thank both, you both uh both of you guys yeah Michelle's fantastic the um and then this is actually a one of my skeletons uh so I, I took a class with Margarita Hagen um who's actually met at Little Berlin um, and she was our first ever studio tour. Oh, yeah. She actually told yeah. me about that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, Margarita is one of my favorite people. She's one of the best people I've ever met in my whole life. Um, and she, I decided to take a ceramics class with her at the end of the spring and over the summer and really like now have this amazing friend that I think I'll have forever, which is great. Um, and she assisted me with so much and she helped me dip um, one of my skeletons in low fire stoneware clay repeatedly or in slip repeatedly and then fire it. So this is the casing, like the slimy casing on the outside of um, one of my sculptures and the string burned away on the inside. So wow. this is incredibly fragile. Um, but How then did I you fire it. that? <laughs> I, she she helped me make little um like a hanging device with kiln wire and i yeah. think it had to be it's low fire so it had to so it was hanging in the kiln so it didn't touch anything yeah it was really stressful but i i can't believe it turned out and i mounted it on this like space age thing um <laughs> and then this is a uh, another piece from the show at the Mütter museum i'm not so into this piece you know it's just kind of part of my life now you know is the fabric is that like fabric or did you crochet it like the bottom part 
when I made this piece, I was really into seeking out remnants at um, estate sales and flea markets. So that's a, a piece of fabric or a, a textile that, um, or doily, for lack of a better term, that someone else had owned. And I was kind of making work about the imagined histories of those objects. Um, um, yeah. And I got a tape in progress here. It's you in bed asleep. <laughs> a tape of you sleeping. Sorry. Like Andy, Andy Warhol. <laughs> Kinda, yeah. Um, and this is that that guy, that uh, lottery ticket. And then I've got my Purell bottle up here. Um, you have a comment. I think it's really amazing that you used fiber for what's effectively a burnout process. That's wonderful. Thank you. That's really, that's really nice of you. Um, yeah, Olivia. yeah. You, you would, yeah, like the, um, the way that the fiber disintegrates inside the clay is crazy. I, I learned a lot about um, materials just from working with Margarita and, you know, yeah, that was awesome. Um, but thank you. Uh, this, this side of the room is my partner, Alex Ekman Lawn's studio. Let's just look at what he does. We can just talk about him. <laughs> he does layers. How do you guys share a space together like that? Does that, does that, uh, is it good or bad? <laughs> he just doesn't come up here. He works oh, okay. downstairs. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, he just doesn't, the truth is that he doesn't work here. I work, <laughs> um, he, he works on his computer and works on the coffee table in our living so room. So you know his work, he makes a lot of collages, right? Yeah, he does, um, yeah layered cut paper collages. So he, uh, what he does is he takes digital collages and then uses um, styro, uh, foam core to space prints of the digital collages um, a little bit like a quarter inch above one another to create this cavernous kind of like descending collage hole. Um, and usually he wow. cuts out faces or um, holes in buildings and stuff like that. He works with a lot of architectural elements and he takes a lot of photos and uses those in the work um so yeah um and this is my window there's a hanging piece by a little holographic hanging piece by uh, Roxana Azar and they're one of my favorite artists right now there's a creepy painting of my mother as a nun <laughs> uh that I pass every time I have to go to the bathroom did you um, paint that no, my mom painted it. Oh, wow. And then that movie, The Conjuring, came out with that nun. <laughs> and it's the same nun. <laughs> like, holy shit, you know? Um, so here is, uh, you know, sometimes I, I, I work on the floor a lot. I really, like, you have to know, like, this is not, this is not as horrible as this normally looks. It's, it's usually... <laughs> A lot. Well, you work uh, very small. I think I've never, I, I never knew that your pieces were modular and yeah. I just love seeing them all laid out on foil like this. Oh, this thanks. Pretty cool. It reminds me of like those models that you have to pop out of, you know, the plastic and then put them all together. Rob Leaf knows about those. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's exactly what it's like. Yeah. Um, yeah. So you know, what I do is I, I crochet them. I have this, this whole little box here of like, let me see if I can get this to, can you see this box with like all my crap? Yeah. There's all these like tree bits and. And they sound like crunchy. They're like, they're like super yeah. sturdy. Yeah, they're sturdy. <laughs> That's the thing. The work is very sturdy. Like you can just throw it around. Who cares, you know? Um, <laughs> that's so funny because your work on display is so delicate and fine and precious <laughs> yeah it's actually pretty pretty sturdy like it's kind of like um like you know I'm I'm part Italian and we do the like the seven fishes for Christmas Eve and uh I I compare I try to use this analogy with a lot of people and sometimes they think it's gross so they don't know what I'm talking about but I um I compare the rigidity to like a, a smelt spine, like a small fish's spine. Like if you do the seven fishes dinner, you're used to eating like these little salty fish and you take the spine out. Um, I'm vegan now. I don't, I haven't eaten one in like 20 years, but oh, wow. um, I, uh, 
I don't know. I maybe this is not even worth saying, but it's it's I I I liken the texture to like a fish spine, a small right. fish spine. It's that kind of rigidity, but you can still bend it um, or break it in some cases. But you know, um, they're more rigid than a lot of people think. Is what yeah. I'm trying to say. Um, and I have some pieces here. This is a uh, that that guy that I was talking about. And this is some more works in this series that I haven't really shown anyone else. Oh, I guess I posted that snake last night on Instagram, but this <laughs> one is like, what the hell is even going on there? Which one, the yellow one? This yellow thing, I don't even know, man. It's like psych psychedelic almost. Yeah, yeah, I think. <laughs> I know actually, um, for some of uh, last year, I had carbon monoxide poisoning. Um, oh, wow. Yeah, uh, I discovered it, um, luckily. How? From, like, I, being in your house or something? Yeah, or? yeah. Oh, my goodness, um, wow. There was an issue with, uh, with my, my furnace, um, because it's a furnace that was typically used to heat swimming pools in the 80s, uh, and that's oh, okay. what was installed in my house, so I, I got okay. carbon monoxide poisoning. So I made that piece while I, now I'm finally understanding why it looks like that, is because I had carbon monoxide poisoning while I made it. Um, <laughs> and I have a... That explains everything. I have a king of jeans bag on my door. Oh yeah, I remember that store. Yeah, this is like a weird little corner. This, I know, I don't even know. Yeah, that's pretty much it. That's like all the stuff that's worth showing anyone in this, in this space. Um, well, I do want to ask you a little bit about your process. Um, I know that you... I guess you make the the, mo the majority of your income from like selling art and doing art shows. Is, is that correct? Yeah. Like, how does that process work? Um, you know, do you have a gallerist come over to your house and um, you show them all the pieces? And can you tell us a little bit about like how, how that works for you? It depends on uh, where the gallery is located. I, I work with a lot of galleries that are on the West Coast and they can't really do a studio visit. Um, which is, you know, they're investing a lot, not being able to see this stuff in person. Um, so yeah. I, you know, there's a lot of um, back and forth emailing, you know, I, I, I enter shows, you know, there's a lot of galleries where I would love to show and I don't think they would really ever give me a chance because my work is not, because um, I don't have an MFA and I'm going to forever feel inferior because of that. But um, also there's a lot of artists who don't, a lot of professional artists who don't have MFAs. Yeah. So, <laughs> I mean, I, you know, I make a living, so that's, you know, that's fine. That's, that's actually very impressive. Oh, thanks. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I, um, uh, if, if it's a gallery, you know, I show a paradigm gallery and studio, which is on fourth street and on fabric row in queen village. Um, and you know, when I have a, a show in the works for them, you know, I, they represent me and I, I work with them pretty regularly. You know, they're, they're a huge part of my life. They'll come over and they'll do a studio visit and kind of give some input. But, you know, a lot of galleries tend to sort of lay off. They, they sort of, from my experience, they sort of just let you do what you want because they don't want to stifle your vision, you know, mm -hmm. unless it's a group show and they are imposing a curatorial vision on, on, what you're doing and your inclusion is hinged on whether or not you can fit into that. Um, it's usually pretty open-ended, but that's yeah. been my experience. That's cool. Um, I know earlier in your talk, you gave your Instagram, but I'm going to give it again to everyone. I just want to talk a little bit about like how you market yourself. Cause you have a very successful social media campaign. You have like 46,000 Instagram followers, just as an example. I mean, that's pretty awesome. How do you, um, I mean, how did you get that many followers? How did you establish yourself? And like, what advice can you give to other artists? Um, man, I, <laughs> so it's really hard to not use like extremely specific references here. So I, um, I didn't really, I, I started working as an artist and I didn't really have any traction on Instagram, but then uh, Jess Schnabel, who runs Blood, Mick, Blood Milk Jewels, um, she shared. I have one on right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, that's a nice one. She's <laughs> amazing. She's, a, she's extremely talented. She is a 
you know, she is someone who has spread awareness about a lot of artists, a lot of people that I'm friends with. And so many people are very deeply indebted to her. She's like, incredible. Um, and uh, she, she shared my work and that's kind of what started it for me. I think in order to get, you know, anywhere on Instagram, you need to just have someone who has more followers than you or more clout or whatever the term people are using now. Someone has to advocate, advocate for you. Um, mm -hmm. So I had that happen. And, you know, at that time, there was just kind of like the right series of things operating in tandem. The show American Horror Story was really big. Everyone oh, right. was dressing like a witch. There were witches everywhere. <laughs> and I fit really, really well into that, um, that paradigm. You know, I, I, because my work, you know, has it, it visually has a lot of the same sensibilities as morning, morning hair work or morning jewelry or any kind of like ornate, decorative, death positive work. And the work was about, you know, traumatic memories and and in some cases death and and um ephemeral fugitive aspects of being alive so i um i can see how it fit into that whole scene uh, and i think i was just really lucky that that those things were happening at that time and that's really what would allow me to flourish for a bit but um you know that kind of that work you know that that aesthetic didn't lasts for very long so I kind of um you know things haven't been like as uh abundant you know it's not like mm -hmm. they, they they don't suck I mean everything sucks but they don't they're not that bad um I mean I feel like that's the life of the artist right you, you kind of go up and down and it's stressful but I mean you're doing it so it's pretty amazing um, we have, we have five minutes left. I don't want to add, I have more questions for you, but I want to open this up. Does anyone have any questions for Caitlin before we start winding down for the night? No, but I think that blood milk was how I found you before I moved to Philly, thanks to well, Tumblr. And then I saw your work on, in Northern Liberties. I want to say ritual, ritual was that? Yeah. Yeah, I curated a show there. That's awesome. Yeah, that's so cool. Long time fan. Thank you. That's really nice of you. <laughs> Anyone else? Do this full time. I, I do have a quick question. So you seem to have really interesting ways of displaying your pieces with and, and it being part of the artwork. So whether it's a piece of furniture or even the frames or the clocks, I'm curious to what, like how often it's, which side of it sort of inspires the other side, like the piece that you're creating from crochet or if it is the piece of furniture or vice versa? That's an interesting question. I mean, I think about that a lot. I, I uh, Sometimes the piece is dictated by the frame, especially with those clock cases. If I find one of those clock cases, I'm like, I need to find something to fit into this because it's just so, it's so enjoyable to make a piece. To, just having the, if you're someone who works with shadow boxes, it's so hard to find a nice deep shadow box. And when you get one that's like four inches deep, you're just like, fucking, I'm gonna make a thing to put in this shadow box. So sometimes I just like, I will make something specifically to fit in one of those. And then the, the ornate nature of it will dictate sort of the, the form and, and the pathways of the sculpture that I make. Um, but, you know, lately I've been working just on these just mounting the velvet bases on these wooden blocks. Um, and I find with that, I, I, it's way more just about the work itself. Um, and I think I'm getting a lot more from it. Yeah. Are you on Etsy? I'm not on Etsy. I, uh, I think I made an Etsy account like 10 years ago and I, I just never finished it. Once they asked for my banking information, I just was like, I'm not going to, give you my banking information. I just um, added Caitlin's website. So I guess if someone wanted to purchase one of your pieces, how would they go about doing that? I have um, a links on my about section to a couple of my online stores. And um, also you can just message me on Instagram and I'll always answer. Um, if you want links to the the places where I have my work available. I, mean, I have worked with Mortal Machine Gallery in New Orleans. 
Antler Gallery in Portland, Paradigm Gallery and Studio in Philly, Arch Enemy Arts in Philly, uh, Hashimoto, Hashimoto Contemporary in uh, San Francisco. Um, my God, there's, oh, in Liquid in Philly. Um, yeah, I have a couple places. A lot of work out there. <laughs> yeah, too much. I oversaturated <laughs> the market. But yeah. All right. Does anyone have one last question? Comments? <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much, Caitlin. This has been really enjoyable. I'm glad I got to talk to you. Thank you. And thanks for sharing all your work with us. I really appreciate awesome. you talking to me. I'm sorry if I was like incredibly. This was amazing stuff. This was great. You did a wonderful job. <laughs> thank you. Awesome. Thanks, guys. All right. Thank you. This was great. Yeah, Bye, guys. Definitely. Thanks, everybody. Bye.